Hello, and welcome to the Verification Academy. I'm Tom Fitzpatrick, Strategic Verification Architect here at Siemens EDA. And this course is Advanced UVM. This course will consist of 10 individual sessions, beginning with this one, in which we will cover UVM test bench architecture. Let's get started. When we think about verifying a particular design, there are certain things we need to think about. The first is we need to think about the interfaces we're going to use to communicate with the design. For each of those interfaces, we need to think about how the interface works, what information is being transferred across that interface? Are there any variants of the transactions that are occurring at that interface? Is it unidirectional, bidirectional, pipeline, those sorts of things. Then we need to think about the actual design itself. What is the design supposed to do? What are the use cases? What variants is it going to be dealing with? And what type of stimulus do we need to create in order to exercise the functionality to make sure that the design is doing what it's supposed to do? We need to be able to represent correct behavior in the test bench. We want the test to be self-checking, so the test bench has to include information about correct behavior. And we want to think about what type of functional coverage we're going to need in order to know that we've actually exercised the DUT in all of the different modes that we'll need to have it run. When it comes to interacting with the DUT, in UVM, we create this thing we call a UVM verification component. It's sometimes called an agent. There's typically one per interface to the DUT, and it includes a driver whose job it is to communicate at the signal level with the interface. We want to do most of the operations, though, at the transaction level, which is the level that we actually think about what's happening. So we'll talk about transaction level modeling in session three, but for now, just think of transactions as units of information that we use to communicate between components. So the sequencer's job is to send stimulus at the transaction level to the driver, and that transaction is what we call a sequence item. So the sequencer sends the sequence item to the driver, the driver takes that transaction and then converts it into pinwiggle activity to the DUT. We also have a monitor connected to the DUT which recognizes that pin level activity and turns it back into transactions, which it communicates out to the rest of the test bench through what we call an analysis port. Now in UVM, every component is configurable. So we have a configuration object which includes all of the information that this agent needs in order to know how to operate in this particular context. One of the things that an agent needs to have is a handle to the virtual interface, which is the mechanism by which the driver actually connects to the DUT. And we also pass in information about how the agent should behave. One of the most basic pieces of information is whether the agent should be active, where the sequencer and the driver should actually be sending information out to the bus, or whether it should be passive, where just the monitor is present detecting that activity on the bus. The agent is connected to the DUT via the virtual interface, and the agent is instantiated in what is called an environment. The environment is itself a component that serves as the structural test bench that instantiates all the components you'll need to verify your DUT for this particular application. A block level environment will typically have one agent per interface, and as we said, environments are configurable. The environment will get its configuration information first and use that information to configure the agent and also to configure itself as necessary. An environment may also include a set of default sequences to run on your sequencer, typically as background traffic for your application. The real sequence will be specified by your test, as we'll see, but you may want to include some sequences in your environment. If you do, it's important to remember that they're there, since they'll be causing traffic on your bus without having been explicitly started in your test. To avoid this confusion, we don't recommend starting sequences in your environment unless you're sure you know what you're doing. Block level environments also typically include a coverage collector of some kind to record the transactions reported by the monitor. The environment is instantiated by the test component whose job it is to instantiate and configure the environment. One of the most important jobs of the test is to specify which sequence or sequences you want to run on the agent sequencer, possibly interleaved with the background sequences from the environment, depending on your application. Another thing the test does is to use the UVM factory to perhaps modify the coverage collector or other component types in your environment. The coverage being collected is often tied closely to the stimulus being generated, so as you run different sequences, you'll probably want different coverage collectors too. You can also use the factory to change the type of background sequence that's run by the environment. We'll see how the factory and configuration work in detail in the next session. Since tests are also components, you can have a library of tests, each of which uses the same environment but configures it in a different way or runs a different set of sequences with different coverage collectors. Often it's the case that you'll have a base test that instantiates the environment and handles basic configuration, and then extend that base test in different ways to create each of your tests. The tests themselves then become relatively simple in that they just specify the sequences or other configuration information, and most of the execution is automatically handled in the environment and the agents. As I mentioned, environments serve to instantiate whatever components you need for your verification application. 
If you have multiple interfaces on your DUT, you'll have multiple agents in your environment, plus coverage collectors and probably a scoreboard of some sort. In this case, the environment will be set up to get its configuration information and then use that to configure the agents. It is possible for the environment to use default configuration settings if they're not overridden by the test, but that's up to you to decide for your application. As in the previous example, the test sets the configuration and factory settings for the environment and specifies the test sequences to run for your application. Notice that there can be multiple tests that use the environment. Since environments are components, they can be instantiated in other environments in a hierarchical fashion. As you integrate your blocks into a more complex DUT, the block level environments can be composed into an integration level environment. From the test perspective, there's still an environment that instantiates verification components. The fact that these components are themselves environments is irrelevant to the test. All components in UVM have the same API, so it really doesn't matter. Notice that we did have to extend the environments to include analysis ports to communicate with the scoreboard. Using object-oriented programming, this is easy to do. We just have to instantiate the extended environments in our integration level environment as we would any other component like the scoreboard. The only thing different about the test would be the composition of the configuration object needed, and it may have to know the path down the hierarchy to each of the sequencers to be able to start the sequences, but that's really no big deal. All right, so now let's see how we make this magic all happen. In UVM, all components, including environments and tests, are controlled by a central phasing mechanism. Each component defines a set of phase methods that get called in a specific order, so you can make sure that everything is completed in any particular phase before moving on to the next. The first phase, build, is called top-down, so we start at the top of the hierarchy and successively build components at each lower level. Any component must be created before its build phase method can be called, so in the test's build phase, it creates the environment which gets added to the list of components. After the test's build phase is complete, the environment's build phase is called, in which it creates the agents, so their build phase methods are called next. After all components have had their build phase method execute, then the phase controller moves on to the connect phase, where it calls each component's connect phase method. The end of elaboration phase is called after everything has been built and connected, so this is a good place to do any last minute tweaking of the environment and printing out your hierarchy for debug purposes, things like that. The start of simulation phase is best used for opening log files and other bookkeeping operations. The run phase is the only task used by UVM. This is where the test actually executes, where sequences are run and transactions generated. Drivers and monitors, as we'll see, will implement run phase as their only task-based phase. UVM actually includes a whole set of additional runtime phase tasks that execute in parallel with the run phase, but experience has shown that these are not really necessary. If you need to manage your stimulus into subsections, it's better to use a virtual sequence to manage execution of things like reset, DUT configuration, test sequences, and cleanup. We'll see more about this in the session on sequences. After run phase completes, UVM goes through another set of phases that allows you to extract data from your components, check results, report what happened, and then close any open files or other final stage cleanup operations. So let's see what the code actually looks like. First, we'll look at the agent code. The DUT agent is extended from UVM component and registered with the factory using the UVM component utils macro. Then the pieces of the agent are declared. Notice that we haven't actually allocated them, that comes next, but we do have to declare the config object, the driver, the sequencer, the monitor, and the top level analysis port. Then since this is a component, we declare the standard constructor using the name and parent arguments and call super.new. In the build phase, we need to actually allocate the components we'll need. The first thing we do, and we'll see this a lot for hierarchical components like this, is to get the configuration object for the agent from the config database. Again, we'll see exactly how this works in the next session, but for now, just understand that this is how we get information from the environment and the test to know how the agent will be used. In this example, we've made it a fatal error if the config object isn't there because it includes critical information that we'll need. If it's possible to use default settings in the absence of the config, you could make this a warning depending on your application. Then, if the agent is to be active, we'll need to instantiate the sequencer so it can send transactions to the driver. Again, we'll see what the create method does in the next session, but for now, just understand that this is how we allocate components. If we have a sequencer, we'll need a driver to connect to it, so we allocate that. Then, regardless of whether we're active or passive, we'll allocate the monitor. There can be other things like coverage collectors inside your agent, but for space reasons, we won't deal with that here. The next step is the connect phase. We pass the virtual interface from the config object down to the monitor, which connects it to the DUT. By the way, this is why it's a fatal error if the config object isn't there, because we need the test to pass in the virtual interface down to the agent. The top-level analysis port is assigned to the monitor's analysis port, 
We could do a connect call here to make this connection, but this works just as well. If the agent is active, we need to connect the driver to the sequencer and the virtual interface gets passed down to the driver. Again, if you have things like a coverage collector, the connect phase is where you would connect them to the monitor's analysis port as necessary. The environment is also a component extended from the EVM ENV base class and registered with the factory. In it, we declare the subcomponents, in this case, the two agents, the scoreboard and the coverage collector, as well as the config object. Then we declare the standard component constructor and pass in a default name for the environment. Then in the environment's build phase method, just as we did for the agent, we look for the config object in the config database, and if it's not there, declare a fatal error. Then the environment will use the agent one specific configuration information and call set to the config database to pass the information down to agent one. This information includes the virtual interface connection to the dot. Then we create the instance of agent one by calling the create method from the factory. Continuing with the build phase, we extract the agent two specific config information from the environment's config and set that in the database for agent two to access. Again, this includes the virtual interface handle. Then we create the instance of agent two. And next we look at the environment's configuration to see if we need to create the scoreboard and the coverage collector. The last part of setting up the environment we'll deal with here is the connect phase. Since the virtual interface connections are handled via the config object, we only need to connect up the internal components. So if our config says that we're going to use the scoreboard, we connect the analysis port of agent one to the first analysis export of the scoreboard, and then we connect agent two's analysis port to the second export of the scoreboard. Similarly, if we have coverage, we'll connect that up to agent one's analysis port. The actual connections that you'll use are of course dependent on your application, but we see here the kinds of things that are typically done in an environment's connect phase. Since we're most likely going to have a series of tests that use this environment, we'll create a base test from which they'll all be extended. As a component, the base test is registered with the factory and declares all the subcomponents it needs, as well as configuration and any other objects it might need. Since this is a component, we give it the standard constructor. Then in the build phase, we want to set up everything that's going to be common across all of the tests so we don't have to repeat the code. That means creating the environment's config object, then filling that configuration object with any useful information. Notice that we use a separate virtual method call here so that the test extensions can change the configuration as necessary. The base test version of this method would most likely get all the relevant virtual interface handles and put them in the configuration object. The test extensions could then add their own configuration settings and use super.config.env to keep the virtual interface handles and add in the other information. Once that's done, we use the config database to set the configuration for the environment. Then we just create the environment. Notice there are no factory overrides here. That's because the base test is just handling the default settings for things. There's an environment instantiated and it will create instances of the agents and analysis components using the default types for them. It'll be up to the test extensions to specify any factory overrides. You'll also notice that we're not using a connect phase here. That's because typically the test doesn't have specific components in it that need to be connected to each other. It usually just instantiates an environment, even if that environment itself instantiates multiple sub-environments. This makes it easier to reuse the structural specification of the environment as we modify the dynamic behaviors of things through the test. The actual test gets extended from the base test and registered with the factory. The only thing this particular test is going to instantiate is a virtual sequence that will coordinate the execution of other sequences in the two agents. The test has the same constructor as other components, and in the build phase, the only thing we have to do is call super.build phase to execute the build phase of the base test. Note that we only call super.build phase on components that are extended from other user-defined components. Never call super.build phase on a component directly extended from UVM component, UVM ENV, or UVM test. Then in the run phase, we need to actually execute the sequence. So first we create it from the factory, and we call phase.raiseObjection. We'll cover this more later, but for now just treat this as a way of telling UVM that there's stuff that's going to happen. In this case, the stuff that happens is that we start the virtual sequence, which causes the sequences to start in the two agents. As we'll see, virtual sequences can execute other sequences sequentially or in parallel in whatever order you need for your application. When the sequence is complete, we signal UVM that we're done by dropping the objection, and UVM exits the run phase and moves on to extract, check, and report. So to summarize, agents are protocol specific, contain a sequencer, driver, monitor, they are used to control a single interface to your DUT. If you have multiple interfaces, you'll have multiple agents. Environments are components that define the topology of your test bench, 
specifying which agents you'll be using, how many instances of each agent, and any other components you'll need like coverage collectors or scoreboards. We create a base test to instantiate the environment and handle default configuration like virtual interfaces. And then we extend that base test to define the actual test where we tweak the configuration or factory settings, start sequences, and handle the raising and dropping of objections to manage when the test ends. Lastly, we recommend that you stick with the basic phasing outlined here, especially using only the run phase task for your components. The other runtime task phases in UVM are actively being considered for modification, if not deprecation, by the committee, so it's best not to use them. That wraps up this session of Advanced UVM Architecting a UVM Test Bench. Please stay tuned for the next session, Understanding the Factory and Configuration. Thanks for your attention.